So my name is Jordan Guyton. I am part of the Open Media Career Engines team as a MiraCorps VISTA. And my primary, I primarily deal with strategic communications, such as partnerships and scheduling working groups such as these. All right. So now we're going to dive into introductions or the agenda. So the agenda, we're going to start with introductions and work our way on down. All right. So during this time, just take your time to introduce yourself with your name, organization, and what brings you here is optional. All I'll start. Um, I'm Faye Edwards from the Colorado Press Association. I'm the communications coordinator, um, and I'm here to learn more about what others are doing to increase diversity and collaboration and um, to hear about ways we can work together to advance our initiatives. Jordan, you want to maybe call people out? Okay. Uh, can we do Madeline? Hi, I'm Madeline Baer. Um, people tend to, to add an additional L to my last name. Um, I'm here as a campaign um, organizer, manager with um, Free Press's News Voices program, which um, is uh, really excited about expanding into Colorado. We've been doing um, a lot of work there. And so I'm here with my colleague, um, Diamond, um, if she is here yet. Um, but I'm here to, to really learn and connect with, with other folks working in local media in Colorado. Thanks for having us. All right. And who else do we have on the call today? I can go. I'll be a volunteer. Um, I'm Meredith Turk. I'm an engagement strategist with Harkin. I'm based in Denver, um, but Harkin is um, spread throughout the world. We have a we have several people in the U.S. We also have some people in Denmark and Europe. Um, we help organizations and newsrooms do engagement better and figure out how to listen to their communities and build feedback loops of engagement. Um, so I am here to share some of what we're doing, some free ways that you all could participate in things that we're doing right now, as well as learn from you all and see how we could support. Awesome. Chris? Hey everybody, great to be on the call. My name is Chris Barge with Community Foundation Boulder County. I'm going to be talking a little bit later about our Trends Reporting Fellowship and our Trends Reporting Lab. Um, good to see you all. Hello. Hello. All right. Cool. We're just doing introductions right now. So if you want to do your name, organization, and what brings you here is an optional question. My name is Erica Meltzer. I'm the Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Colorado. We're a news organization focused on education issues, and we have we try to bring an equity lens to what we do, and especially before, even before, but especially now, we're trying to um, figure out how we can have more um, more authentic two-way engagement with our audience, and also really elevate the voices of youth. Um, particularly youth of color and um, and provide a platform so that their voices um, have more reach. All right, Kathy. Hello, everyone. I'm not on camera. <laughs> I'm camera shy. Just kidding. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I'm with Cumulus Media, Colorado Springs. Um, been in the industry many, many years, and we, of course, are a large-scale uh, broadcast company across the United States, and was invited to participate and learn more about um, needs, projects, um, concerns. Um, we are a commercial radio broadcaster, so I'm looking forward to learning more and seeing how we can interface and, and help everybody out. Awesome. All right. And I want to be cognizant of everybody else's time, so... If you could 
continue the introductions within one of the Q and A's or questions. And I just want to wrap it up with the open media team doing a quick introduction of themselves. Today. Sure, um, I'm Hannah Hines and like Jordan, I'm also an AmeriCorps VISTA. Um, I am focused on our open media career engine that I will be speaking about later on in the presentation, as well as helping with our intern and mentorship program as well. Right. I'm Erin Oldhouse. I am new to OMF and also to Denver, and I'm working with Jordan and Hannah on their AmeriCorps VISTA responsibilities, and I'm excited to learn more about engagement in the media. Uh, my name is Leslie Roth. I'm with Denver Open Media. I have a morning show I, I do every morning on Denver Open Media, 8 to 11, myself and Brian Brown, Kodiak. So I'm here to figure out, uh, to learn a lot more about everybody else uh, within the industry. Anybody else want to quickly introduce themselves? Sure. I'm Jan I'm the managing editor of Arc Valley Voice. Sorry, I'm not on visual today. Balancing, juggling several projects right now. Uh, we're part of the uh, open, whoops. Somebody's got music going. Anyhow, we're, <laughs> we're part of the Colorado Media Collaborative. And uh, we cover the Arkansas River Valley, but our readership goes well beyond this country. Great, thank you. Hello. I'm DJ. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm DJ Bella Scratch. I represent um, KUVO as well as the Drop HDT channel. I'm a broadcaster and on air personality on both. And I'm here to learn about the efforts and initiatives that are going on uh, to figure out how I can best support and help as a fellow broadcaster as well as a person of color. DJ Different, AKA Mr. I'm on the list. I work with The Drop as well as KUVO. I'm an on-air host as well as a music director. I'm a king, a god, a black man. I'm here to gain knowledge and share knowledge. Hi, I'm Lynn Schofield Clark. I'm a professor at the University of Denver in journalism studies. I'm also chair of the Department of Media, Film and Journalism Studies. And I work with Colorado Media Project um, along with a number of other people in higher ed to try to build some liaisons between higher ed and the resources that we once had <laughs> with the communities. Uh, I also work with young people um, who live in publicly subsidized housing on various projects related to amplifying youth voice. This is Philip Clapham with the Colorado Media Project. Um, I think I, I'm here ongoing with you guys, really here to listen um, um, and to help this work and from what we're doing with the collab as it launches this year. I'm uh, station manager at KGNU Community Radio. Uh, just appreciate y'all uh, facilitating this space. Here to learn as well, thanks. Hello. Do you hear me, guys? We do. Okay, so I am Rosanna Longo, and I am also with KGNU Community Radio. I am the bilingual equity reporter. Thank you for having me today. Hi, everyone. I'm Leticia Stefan. I'm a professor of media communications at Colorado State University Pueblo, and actually, um, joined in with this group because of an invitation I got from Sandy Nance, who's the president of Colorado Press Women, and she asked me just to sit in and listen and report back to them, and I'm also gonna be happy to share whatever I learned today with um, all the other groups I'm involved with. So thanks for bringing us all together. Am I the, am I the last one here? My peace, Stephen. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Hall. I'm an uh, uh, investigative uh, 
journalist, I guess, and a reporter with the Arc Valley Voice. Jan Wondra is our managing editor. And uh, I'm a former Marine cop trooper and uh, Border Patrol agent. Kind of had to go through the system to see what we're seeing now is uh, uh, how bad it's broken. And I uh, want to just, this is the best way I've found to be able to fix it. So working on it. That's everyone. Uh, I just joined. I am Enrique Jimenez from Kubo.org, um, Kubo Radio Station. I'm the marketing and engagement specialist there. Sorry for being late. Um, I was on Google Meet for some reason. I also joined over from Google Meet. My name is Kathleen Shannon. I'm here from KDNK Community Access Radio based in the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, we have a quite a white population up here, so definitely trying to stay tuned to what's going on in the front range and make sure uh, we're, we're doing the right thing up here in the media too. Thanks for having us. Um, and it's Kelly Griffin from Colorado Public Radio. And uh, one of my roles is to, is collaborations editor. So that's what brings me here. All right, just wanna thank everybody for coming out. It is an amazing turnout that we're having. So we're gonna jump right in to the NGSP model and ask Colleen to give us an overview of that and the working groups. Colleen, you can screen share if you like. All right, will do. Well, hi everyone. I want to introduce myself as well. Sorry, as I'm figuring out my computer here. Um, presents. Okay, so I'm with the Colorado Workforce Development Council, and one of the things we do is we try and help create in different regions throughout the state um, and support uh, sector partnerships. And as what a sector partnership is, um, is a large collaboration between the business and various industries and we do it's more than just workforce although we are the ones and especially nowadays workforce is a big big topic but um the other issues what keeps businesses up at night so we bring together economic development adult ed colleges chamber of commerces um so just any sort of uh public partner um that would be willing and able to support the local community. Um, but we do want to keep industry at the center um, and find out what those businesses deal with directly. And my next slide here, Tony, does go into the um, working group part. So did you want to say anything else about this or did you want me to just slide right in from one to the other? I think you can just jump right into that. Thank you. Okay. Well, when you first start a sector partnership, we do. We find out what the priorities are, what you, keeps you up at night. So then we create action teams and trying to define success. What does it look like for us and our team? So when we are looking at creating the working groups and creating what our action items are going to be, we're hoping for quick wins at first. Um, a lot of this work, if, if it was solvable over a weekend, you know, business owners would would take care of it themselves. But um, that's part of the large collaboration. So we are looking though for some quick wins just to gain that traction, get people used to working together before they maybe dive into a bigger topic. Um, but we are trying to get a high impact um, is the first criteria. We're hoping that the change will be feasible, hope, you know, something that we can do within a year time frame or less. Um, and not assuming that, you know, we're gonna get, you know, someone unreachable or that we don't know or aren't connected with to come in and, and fix it for us. However, inviting other uh, sources or people that, that aren't at the table that we think are important, that's still absolutely something that we would want to do. So what we'll dive into is what's our first win? What could we do? Um, who's gonna be involved? Um, we're hopefully, only an hour or two of people's time if you're on the work group. And then um, we wanna just make sure it is that champion driven priority. We are not handing off the problem, but we want to have the, the businesses 
be part of the solution. And so that's kind of where we try and go with the action teams to um, kind of meet more often than you would meet as an entire sector partnership. And that way you can uh, kind of get solutions put together and then take them to uh, the larger community to see if everybody agrees with what we're trying to do as far as our next steps. So these are just a couple of samples of priorities and outcomes that different uh, regions have had uh, in healthcare in region five. Um, they're trying to address the shortage of healthcare workers right now, especially out in the rural areas, it's grow your own. Um, so they did, they wrote a grant to get people trying to train 30 people in healthcare in five years and they were able to speed that up and actually got 29 within three years. So that was a really good win for them. Region three healthcare, they also wanted work-based learning. They um, created five different apprenticeships. Um, region two, Nor Northern Colorado manufacturing, um, any of you have, that have been involved in sector partnerships have probably heard of a lot of the work they have done. They have been around for seven years. They've got a ton of just, you know, different people involved, a lot of different businesses. So, so they are, they, um, they've had a lot of different success stories. So, um, with their parents night, they've hosted all those internships, externships, and yeah, they've really worked hard to create a, a good talent pipeline. Um, Region 11, upscaling their workforce development model. Um, so they got a maker space to help with their um, uh, hosting the classes. And so they've had a lot of enrollment and that just helps employers keep employees and be able to potentially even uh, promote them within the within the business and region 13 tech um, they have so many things going on uh, they, they've got a lot of interest and in everything with them is about you know the work from home um, you know getting a lot of people to rural Colorado why would you have to be in Denver or why would you have to be in Silicon Valley um, they've got um, good internet and so they've been able to take advantage of it and in their high school they did end up um this is listing as a finalist they won um the uh education award for for that teacher so um a lot of good things that have come from different partnerships and this metric sorry wow that that just jumps out huge but basically you guys are emerging so it's going to be early evidence of progress so just getting together trying to find some ways to start connecting because all these different businesses and associations everybody has their own niche and their own goals so just coming up with that commonality and getting into the you know what you can do so versus you know a partnership that's been active for a year or two years and the advanced like I said with Northern Colorado you know having a hundred volunteers go for something nope it's, it's fine to have two or three you know to start with and usually it does grow as you have those successes so I just wanted to kind of highlight that as well um, that that everybody starts small typically and I will stop screen sharing um, Great. Well, thank and you. Did you want to add anything? Or go for no. It? Yeah, I'll just I'll just take it from there. So, uh, thank you, Colleen. And uh, where's the notes? I'm gonna stop my screen share for a second. I'm gonna screen share a more detailed agenda. I just wanted to also give a little bit of um, more context. I want to thank Colleen for what she prepared. Uh, the Next Generation Sector Partnership is a project aimed at just um, increasing uh, workforce opportunities and uh, promoting more collaboration in these different sectors. Because the Open Media Foundation, a big part of our goal is making sure underrepresented communities have more voice in media and journalism. Uh, we saw their model as a, a great resource uh, to, to organize the work that we're doing to, to open opportunities uh, for more diverse voices in media. and. They had previously mostly focused on industries that represent a much larger percentage of the workforce. Um, you know, there's a lot more jobs in some of those industries that Colleen was just describing, retail and manufacturing and healthcare and construction. Um, 
but they agreed that that you know the significance of having these diverse voices the impact of of having these opportunities in media and journalism uh is is significant enough that uh it makes up for the fact that we're a smaller per percentage of the workforce so we've just started uh applying their next generation sector partnership model to to media and journalism industry and uh it's it's, it's been a great model that's making sure it's really industry-led led by the people on this call uh rather than led by um you know outside foundations or or um or community organizations that have different agendas. So we've been really grateful to, to partner with them and, and we've had, we run two different working groups aimed at kind of resolving some of these issues and some of these problems that, um, that I think Jordan is going to show us uh, in a little bit um, around, around the lack of diversity in, in media and journalism. The first uh, working group is is a working group focused on diverse hiring and and we've started a program that Hannah is going to talk about in a little bit that helps make sure even media organizations with without a big HR department can get more diverse applicants for their jobs and then the second uh, working group which is uh, engagement um, and we feel like engagement. Uh, uh, Jordan will you mute maybe everybody else for a little bit um, uh, so engagement can be a tool for building a culture of, of greater diversity and, and inclusiveness, even when you may not be hiring or have a lot of job openings that you could use uh, your hiring process to diversify your, your team. So that's really what we're here to talk about today. And I think a lot of times when people talk about engagement, they just think of um, maybe outreach or like awareness. And so in the agenda that I just shared, there's three links that talk about types of engagement and kind of broadening our, our views of engagement. Um, uh, a lot of it comes from, from uh, University of, of Oregon, Andrew David Gall uh, and the Agora Center. Um, and uh, there's also an article from, uh, it's not too visually appealing, but Peggy Holman's uh, Forms of Engagement uh, diagram, which I'm sharing here, that talks about, you know, um, as you move further to the right, it's really empowering um, your community members to have more of a voice to make any media or journalism outlet or platform you have be truly representative of your, of your community and less and less uh, having the community flow through you as a filter and more and more allowing your community to to have a direct um direct connection with uh with the audiences on your platform uh so we just briefly wanted to introduce that but uh and andrew david gall has joined previous calls and will join future ones but he he wanted to make sure we um steer people towards towards their their resources um, so the goal for today is to define and identify some opportunities that exist in regard to partnership and collaboration around engagement, especially in light of what's going on right now in the world. Uh, if you guys have been, I'm sure we're all media junkies, we've all been following local coverage of, of what's been happening. And I would say that there is a, a lack of voices, especially in the larger outlets um, of, of diverse voices and voices that represent the perspective of these community members in the streets, um, specifically African Americans uh, in, in, our, in a lot of our major media outlets. Um, there's a lot of other working groups. Um, I think I'll skip over that because we're a little bit behind schedule, but um, you know, working groups that, that, that we aren't uh, um, running or coordinating like the great uh, work being done by Colorado Media Project and the CoLab, the Collaborative Journalism, I'm sure you guys are already all familiar with, uh, that started with this COVID project that you can find at collabnews.co. Uh, again, the hiring uh, process, which we'll talk about later. Um, so, uh, so this next, the bulk of our presentation, the bulk of the time today is, is, is having partners like you guys present some of these initiatives and opportunities for media engagement. The first step to really partnering uh, and collaborating is just making sure we all know what each other are working on and that can spark other ideas. So uh, Jordan, do you want to start out with with a little bit more introduction of the of kind of the problem that we're here to resolve? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, 
All right, so right now we're looking at the initiatives and opportunities that's coming. So I wanna call attention to the media workforce statistics and this chart on the side. So what is going on in media is that media is typically 10 to 20% less diverse than any other industry that is out in America. So the issue that we're facing is our audience is 60% white and 49% male. But when you look at Colorado or when you look at the U.S. as a whole, it's not very reflective of that. So our newsrooms, we need to figure out how to increase diversity by having it be more authentic, have more authentic voices. And when you look at this graph, you see that the disparity is just seeing that it's still that old systematic way of doing things when you want to add people that are diverse to tell their stories in the community, especially in times like this, it is needed to have somebody that is representative of that community. So that is the reason why we're here today to talk about more engagement initiatives and calls to actions on how to fix this, this discrepancy that we're facing today. All right. And then we have the open media career engine. Hannah, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Hannah, we can't hear you if you're talking. Oh, uh, you have to unmute her. Sorry, guys. Um, so the open media career engine is a a relatively new um, project of Open Media Foundation, and it's been created as maybe um, part of the solution to get more diverse um, into news by providing supplemental HR to um, smaller news and media organizations. Um, and we do this by in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, we start by coaching um, prospective employers with um, crafting job descriptions that um, are both inclusive and have a diverse appeal. Um, we then take these job descriptions and post them to um, over 20 different outlets and job boards that have demonstrated um, to generate the most diverse applicants. Um, we also like to leverage partnerships that we have um, with some government agencies, including Denver Workforce, ResCare, um, and those partners help to identify candidates that might be eligible for OJT or matching funds um, and other similar government subsidized programs. Um, and so for the data section, so we collect all the resumes, um, resumes and cover letters of all applicants that apply for a position. Um, we work with employers to create a customized survey um, that will collect demographic data and any other data that the employer might want. Um, we then um, use best practices from top grading um, to um, rank and sort candidates based on criteria set forth by, um, by the employer. Um, we um, pride ourselves on sort of being time saving. Um, we like we organize all the applicants, documents, and demographic data um, to to make it easier for an employer to um, quickly review lots of candidates. And um, we also schedule the um, first round interviews, um, aligning with the availability of the employers. Um, and then sort of circling back to the data section, um, we use the data that's collected from these demographic surveys to identify which job boards um, are giving us the most qualified and best candidates, which job boards um, have the most diverse candidates, um, either through ethnicity or gender or any other um, EI information that an employer might want to look at. Um, and we also use this survey to enroll um, prospective job seekers into our Open Media Career Engine program um, which notifies them of prospective job, 
opportunities in um, media and the media, um, lets them know about internships and volunteerism, networking opportunities, and also uh, makes them aware of uh, government subsidized programs um, aimed at helping them get on the job training in media and communications. Great. So as Hannah was saying, this is a useful resource, not only if you're hiring, it's a completely free service that we offer to help diversify the workforce in Colorado media. But uh, we're also building a huge database of just job seekers uh, in, the, in the industry. So we've had well over a thousand people who are skilled people looking for work in the industry that we can also leverage as a volunteer pool and, uh, and just a great database of uh, as a resource. So, so if you have any other opportunities, whether they're mentorship opportunities or volunteer opportunities, it's also a, da a growing database that we can reach out to. Um, the last example, I wanted to invite Les to, to talk a little bit about, about the model at DOM. I think when we were looking at the, the continuum of engagement from Andrew David Gall or the forms of engagement from Peggy, um, the, the approach at, at stations like KGNU uh, and like DOM, uh, it's it's um, essentially kind of often handing the keys of the of the media organization over to community members. Uh, and so I just wanted to give Les a couple minutes to uh, uh, talk about the model there for empowering volunteers and listeners to generate content and really manage uh, a radio station in ninety two point nine and eighty nine point three HD three. So Les, you want to step in for a minute? Yeah. My name is, uh, is Les Roth, Leslie Roth, but go by Les. So uh, I was given the opportunity by Denver Open Media and Tony uh, to do a show. We're doing a morning show, and it's, only, it's local driven. So we're doing only local music, and the topics are normally we're talking about what's going on locally here. Of course, we do talk about other things, but locally here, especially right now, this has been a perfect platform, and that, that – uh, it, it go when you see the the number of listeners that we have just from doing this it's only been a month it's outstanding especially for the local people to have a platform for their music to be played because there's really no station in the city that really plays only local music they may play one or two local songs but we are 100 percent local music driven and uh what i have found out is it's a lot of very very talented people here especially with the r b of course, you would think that rap would be what you would hear, but the R&B side and the jazz side has been phenomenal. It's been simply uh, phenomenal. So uh, it, it's been a great platform. And also, we have another show that's, that we have that's going on as well. And that show is from four to six on Wednesdays. And we have a guy that comes in, Alan Matthews, that plays only local rock, all forms of rock. Uh, the platform has been great, and especially getting the message out right now, uh, Brian Brown, Kodiak, who's on with me in the mornings from 8 to 11, uh, to dig deep into what's going on with the community and across the world with, uh, with the, as far as the protests and everything else that's going on, along with uh, I think most people have forgotten about is COVID. So it's a, we, we ha we're a platform that was been, we have a platform that's been given to us by Denver Open Media, where we can now talk about everything that's going on in Denver, and people have a voice now. And I think it's great. Uh, thanks, Les. Um, yeah, so we might we might get back into that, but it's, uh, we've been so happy with what Les has done. And Les isn't just doing his own show. He, as an empowered community member and volunteer, has been bringing in other volunteers, other DJs. Uh, to, to help just broaden the perspectives available through uh, that new radio station, which is celebrating its one year anniversary today, by the way. Okay, cool. We're gonna have a, we're gonna have a couple bands and, and stuff broadcasting at 5 p.m. today. Shameless plug. So next on the, uh, next on the agenda is Meredith. Is that right, Jordan? Correct. Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, I'll take it away. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to try to pack a lot into this. Um, can I just get a show of hands who's heard of Harkin before? Okay, a few people. Not, not entirely sure where to begin. Um, 
<laughs> I like that. Okay, we need some music here today, next time. Um, so I wanted to share some of the free offerings that we're providing right now in, in the community and, and ask for ways that you all can contribute and, and um, maybe you can think of ways that we could support you all. Um, so one, there's a couple things, I linked them in the agenda. Sorry, Jordan, I just edited the agenda. Actually, I'm not sorry, I just, I want all the information to get out. So one thing, I'm gonna share my screen and just show you all um, what this first thing is. Okay, can you all see my screen? So this is um, one platform that we've just launched. We've merged with a new company called Switchboard, which actually started out in higher ed. And it's an asks and offers platform. And so it's really simple. And right now we're seeing a lot of mutual aid platforms using this right now to get information out to their communities. So it's really simple. You can say, I'm asking for X and I'm offering X, but we specifically launched this for engagement and for people in media space and, you know, journalists or people who are, you know, in media. So I invite you all to sign up to this today. So we just launched this, but I just asked if you all could join. So I'm going to send you the link. You can click on it and you can hop in there. So there's a lot of really cool stuff. Someone's offering to give Spanish translation and feedback. Um, and someone is offering to tell best story practices of engaged TV storytelling. And then someone is asking, um, actually from Italy, how to involve associations in their work. Um, and someone's asking for hiking recommendations. So it doesn't all have to be media, but the whole point is to create um, a network of people who are really interested in media and engagement. So I'm gonna put this in the chat and it's also, again, in the agenda and I'm happy to follow up. Um, cool, thank you. Um, let me just send it right now. And again, my I'll make sure everyone has my email, but it's um, at the top of this chat. If you're confused about that platform, email me. If you want to know if you can share it with other people, just let me know. Um, but that's a great way to start if you're like less, if you're wondering how to get more audience members, you know, uh, at a certain time of night. Maybe uh, you can post in there. Maybe someone will see that and give you an answer or like okay. provide some feedback. So hop in there, use that as a space to connect. Um, and people are really focused on that. Um, I'm going quickly here. Um, the next thing I want to um, show you is, this is exciting. I'll share screen again. Um, so we are, working with um, the Democracy Fund and Trusting News. Um, if some of you know about those organizations, um, we've launched a free election training for, we're trying to get several hundred, hundred journalists in this program. And so there's a link right there in the chat. And I am gonna share my screen once more. Um, cool, uh, let me see here. Uh, uh, oh. Here it is. So that's the link I just sent to you. Um, you can apply right now through June 26 for the July cohort. Um, and then we're offering July cohorts, August and September. And so you could, you could apply for other months if July is a crazy month for you for some reason. But we are doing three tracks. So we're training around engaged elections, trustworthy elections, and election protection. Um, so just take, take a look at that when you have time. Um, and please do share this widely with your networks. Um, we really want to increase um, the amount of people that are in this. It is a free training and you're getting some of the highest quality training um, from, you know, election, engaged election journalists across the country. So please share this and I will follow up with more detail in case you want to share that widely and you need more advice. One more thing that's for free. Um, is everyone, does this resonate with anyone? Can I just get like a show of hands? Okay, cool. Five minutes is hard to do all this. So I appreciate you all. Um, so one more thing that I will share is we just launched something called community deep dives and 
we, the whole point is, um, there's another link. Um, the whole point is to talk once a month about how to build exciting communities and resilient communities. Um, and so we're starting internally at Harkin. We had um, our co-founder talk about developing a worldwide dance party for women um, that is in its 14th year. So we talk about like why, how, how was that started? And I'm actually gonna be presenting on my own community, which is um, a cooperative housing, uh, a limited equity housing cooperative that I live in in Denver. So June 24th, you'll be able to hear me talk about what I learned about living in community and how it can be applied to media. Um, and then if any of you have communities that you're involved in that you would like to share or showcase, please let me know. Please, please register or shoot me an email. Um, and I'm gonna put my email in the chat as well. So hopefully I didn't take up too much time, but I appreciate you all. And those are three ways that you can get involved right now for free. Thank you. Jordan, you want to take us what's next? Thank you so much, Meredith. Jordan, you're muted if you don't know. All right, next up on the agenda, we have Chris Barge with Community Foundation of Boulder. <clears throat> hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to be on this call today. So many interesting tools and ideas. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm with Community Foundation, Boulder County. Um, prior to that, I was 10 years in Colorado's newspaper industry as a reporter and editor. Um, we have had a trends report. It's a community indicators report at our foundation for going on more than 20 years. In the last several years, we have evolved it into a journalism project that also aligns with our chief vision at the Community Foundation of Equity. Um, you know, we take an approach that is about um, making sure that we do nothing about us without us, that we stand with vulnerable and marginalized communities and that we believe in accomplishing more together than alone. And so taking that approach and that value set into journalism has meant an expanded trends initiative. Trends report is what we call our, our indicators report. Um, so in addition to going deep on our community's most pressing issues involving equity um, in a magazine format, we also expanded and became uh, deep partners with KGNU. And um, they now have a regular podcast. And Rosanna, the bilingual equity reporter for KGNU is on this call. And uh, she is our leader on that project and about every three weeks drops a, a new uh, podcast that delves deeply into one of the topics of pressing community concern. It really, each episode has turned out to be like a mini documentary. Um, you know, I have no idea how many people she interviews, but there's at least 13 really high quality voices in each episode. It's worth checking out. Um, as we've moved into this quarantine uh, phase, we uh, started a new feature called Trends Diary, which was a first person way uh, so that our neighbors in Boulder County could tell first person stories of connecting and solving problems uh, in the midst of this uh, time of social isolation. And right now in collaboration with KGNU, we're working on a Trends Reporting Fellowship, uh, which we hope to put together and roll out um, with an emphasis on journalists of color um, everyone will be committed to tackling equity-oriented stories, and uh, hopefully you'll be hearing more about this opportunity um, in the late summer time frame. It, it will be a, about a nine to ten month learning opportunity uh, for journalists to get some of that professional development that perhaps the agency that, or institution you're working for just doesn't have the budget uh, to offer anymore. Uh, it also provides a... Um, a cohort opportunity for journalists here in Boulder County um, to begin collaborating on stories. We'll be pulling in on the expertise of the Solutions Journalism Network and a couple other uh, collaborators, perhaps news voices. Um, the whole point will be uh, for us to align on some of the stories that uh, just don't get as much attention, particularly in this atmosphere of cut budgets. But I would submit that you know this call and this sort of work 
Um, I think uh, nationally, you know, we're more ready for this, especially in the last couple of weeks than we've ever been. Um, people are trying to figure out what they can do, how they can be allies, how they can raise up uh, voices of, uh, of, of black and brown and ind indigenous uh, neighbors. And so we hope to play a small role in, um, in building that movement uh, through this project. The last thing I'll mention is that we've put together a solutions fund. And so the idea is that with an increased amount of reporting focused on issues of pressing concern through an equity lens, when the community feels like there's, there's an opportunity um, to do something about some of these issues that we're grappling with, we've put some funding together as a community foundation to act like a grant maker in support of catalyzing community response to issues that are needing to be addressed through an equity lens. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And um, again, appreciate uh, everybody coming together and Open Media Foundation for holding this forum. Awesome, thank you, Chris. All right, so next up we have Madeline from Free Press. Hi, um, thanks Thanks also for, for pulling this together, Jordan and Tony. Um, it's really great to, to be here um, and connect with you all. Um, and, and it's also a, a good time for, for us to introduce the work of News Voices as we're preparing to, um, to, to launch a News Voices Colorado program um, with a forthcoming um, organizer. Um, so I've, I've prepared a super short slideshow, just kind of giving folks an overview of what News Voices is and how we approach community engagement as a part of local journalism. Um, but before going into that, I actually want to pass the mic to um, my forthcoming colleague, Diamond Hardiman, um, who actually hasn't officially joined until Monday, but I'm glad she can be here to introduce herself uh, today. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, so my name is Diamond Hardiman. I'm a native of Denver, Colorado, but I just graduated from St. Louis University. Um, and my main focus of study there was political science and African-American studies. Um, I was really excited to join this project because as an organizer throughout college and throughout all of my life, I've understood the huge role that media plays in shaping movements as well as informing people and shaping the stories that we understand about the things that we're fighting for today. Um, and this is especially more prevalent, as we all know, given the um, varying circumstances that are going on today. So yeah, it's nice to meet everyone. And I hope I can connect with everyone soon. Great. Thanks, Diamond. Um, so um, I've, I've had the privilege of, of um, getting to know many of you and, and starting to work with you in the past few months. Um, for those of you who aren't really familiar with News Voices, um, I'm going to, going to share my screen. Um, so I'm actually based in Oakland, California. Um, News Voices is a program of a national media advocacy organization free press um, that really seeks to transform the media to realize a more just society. So we work on issues from net neutrality to prison phone justice, um, online platforms, and News Voices is our program really focusing on local journalism. And um, we launched this program five years ago, really to bring the public into the conversation about the future of local news. Um, you know, for several decades, um, communities have seen their local news really contract through mergers and layoffs, um, you know, leaving so many people without the news that they need to be informed. Um, but for much longer than that, um, local news often hasn't reflected and served diverse communities um, with news outlets disinvesting resources in covering and serving communities of color, um, and with newsrooms becoming more white, even as, as our country is becoming less diverse. So um, we really think of, um, of community members as constituents of local news, um, really not just consumers. 
Um, and so while there's a conversation within journalism as an industry about the future of local news and what that should look like, we really believe that community members should be a, at the heart of those conversations um, because they're the ones who need information um, to, to make informed decisions, to understand um, their neighbors and understand how, how their policymakers um, are, are, are wielding power. Um, and, you know, it's community members who are reflected in the narratives that are told or mistold or neglected. And so we really do that using an organizing approach. Um, so, you know, we think that there are many things that journalists can learn from community organizers. Um, really based around building strong relationships um, between media outlets, uh, between community organizations, and most importantly, between journalists and the community members that they cover and serve. Um, you know, we can, we can learn tactics of, of listening um, and of really thinking about the role that newsrooms and journalism plays in a larger ecosystem of news and information um, that's shared in a community and really thinking through how journalists can share and build power with community members in the work that they do. And so this is really, you know, long-term work that involves um, strengthening relationships. And so in most of the places where we've worked, it is, has been very place-based with a community organizer um, that is, is based in a place for several years. So we've done this work in New Jersey, in North Carolina, and we just hired someone in Philadelphia and Diamond in Colorado. Um, and so, you know, just a few examples of what this work looks like is, you know, collaborative storytelling projects where community members are involved from the very start of, um, of pitching stories through the, the distribution of stories um, in media. We also um, help facilitate conversations between community members and journalists. Um, in some places, we've worked with news outlets to develop a community advisory board, really to help build trust um, with the communities that they serve. And, and I'll leave it there because I know we're short on time. Um, but I'm just really excited that we're launching News Voices Colorado and a few of the things that, that we really seek to do is to deepen relationships among local media ecosystems, um, to work with community members to really identify the information needs um, and assets of communities throughout the state, um, and work with newsrooms and journalists to build the capacity to do this sort of community engagement and organizing work. Um, and through that, you know, also work with larger networks um, and peers to to share some models of community centered journalism. So I'll, I'll leave it right there. And um, thank you again for including this. Very right, cool. Thank you, Madeline. And All right. Madeline, I put a link in the agenda just uh, from what I found is anywhere else that people should look to to learn more about this exciting uh, Colorado News Voices or News Voices Colorado project? Um, no, newsvoices.org is the place to go to learn more about kind of the the approach of News Voices, um, but we haven't yet launched anything publicly around News Voices Colorado. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So next group that we have is from Colorado Press Association. And we have Jill and Bay. Hi, I'm gonna just share, we have a little presentation, so I'm just gonna share my screen and pull that up really quick. Okay, can we all see that? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, First, thanks for having us here. We're really excited to be a part of this conversation and um, be part of this, this working group. Um, so a little bit about who we are. I'm here with Jill Farshman, our CEO. I'm Bay Edwards, the communications coordinator. 
um, at CPA and a little bit about why we're here today. So CPA is focused on the importance of diversity and inclusion um, in developing next generation newsroom leaders. So what we mean by that is as newspapers are bought and sold, passed down, transformed, and newsroom managers are being hired, um, there has to be a drive and effort to ensure diverse candidates, whether through identity, thought, or class, are included in that process. Um, we recognize that building diversity into the pipeline can help lead a culture of inclusion. Um, and we also recognize that succession planning can sometimes be overlooked as an opportunity um, to develop newsrooms for long-term success and a way to reimagine the future of that organization. So we'd like to ensure that current newsroom leaders understand how diversity, inclusion, and equity are operational imperatives that increase value. We're looking to explore ways we can ensure diverse candidates are considered and brought into the process and that conversations around succession planning and leadership positions at our members' publications, um, that they're brought into those conversations. Our argument is that creating a culture where newsrooms better reflect the communities they serve must be driven from the top. All right, so we are kind of tag teaming this a little bit. I'm Jill Farshman, I'm the CEO at Colorado Press Association. Um, in our 143 year history, I uh, am the third woman to hold this role. So just to give you <laughs> a little bit of insight there. Um, and I just want to uh, talk a little bit, um, Bay, if you can go to the next slide. Um, I, I spent, just to give a little bit of background, about 25 years in training and organizational development and doing a lot of leadership development. And I've come to the conclusion that you can't, first of all, fix anybody who shouldn't have been hired in the first place with training. And you can't, um, you can't create um, a diverse and inclusive environment without having an equitable environment. And so, you know, this is kind of a model that I work from in thinking about the future of newsrooms and newsroom leadership. Um, and as Bay stated, I really think that um, just in general, that if we don't think about leadership and we only um, think about the newsroom level, um, that we'll have a harder time in making some really profound and necessary transformative changes um, in, our, in our industry. So um, at, I've oftentimes spent in my career um, time being the only woman um, in, in male professions. And, um, and it's very, you know, it's, it's difficult to be like the representative of womanhood, you know, for an entire uh, for an entire company just because you happen to be alone. So, um, and you can see in these, um, these interlocking circles, you know, from our perspective, that, that having only, you know, two legs or one leg to this three-legged stool, um, you pay a price in morale and underperformance and stagnation as, as organizations. So we don't have to tell you, if you can go to the next slide. We don't have to tell you, I think this is um, very interesting from the American Press Institute. It's pretty, pretty current, but um, sometimes I believe that people um, approach diversity or in inclusion like it's a, um, you know, a benevolent act as opposed to um, an imperative um, goal operationally. And also um, when we talk specifically about journalism, that it's critical to, to journalism uh, to make sure that the people who are doing the reporting are representative of the community, but also there are just tons and tons of studies and research showing um, quantitatively that um, diverse and inclusive workforces um, are more, are more um, productive, are more successful, are more profitable, um, so by any measurement, there's actually no, um, no quantitative reason why um, people shouldn't look at this as just something that has to be done, not the latest shiny, pretty thing that, um, you know, because we're in, um, in under duress and, and um, incredibly traumatized in this moment in time, 
um, that is not the, the driver. It's, um, it's just necessity and it's not optional. So there are decades of newsrooms um, di like imp implementing diversity programs, but we still don't see the newsrooms reflecting the communities that they're serving. Um, according to a uh, Census Bureau, the racial and ethnic minorities comprise almost 40% of the US population yet make up less than 17% of newsroom staff and only 13% of newsroom leadership. Um, so succession planning is key to the future of local newsrooms and what the next generation looks like will depend on who takes over in leadership positions. As we look to building sustainable newsrooms in Colorado, um, inclusive and equitable cultures can become drivers for attracting diverse leadership candidates. And 44% of member newsroom owners are at or beyond retirement age. So this is apparent as an opportunity for growth, especially within um, CPA and our membership base. We also see that industry transformation will come from innovators and disruptors with new models, but um, the with the same commitment to editorial integrity and, and quality. So just um, to talk for a moment about some of the entity models that are changing the landscape. Um, can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. The reason why this is so important is that I think the traditional model for succession is basically um, I have a news operation, I decide it's time for me to retire, I sell it to someone and I move on. So in the heyday, you could sell it at a great, you know, a great profit and right off into the sunset. And I don't need to belabor any of the, you know, consolidation issues or other things that have happened um, to the industry. But I can offer the idea that we do have new ownership models that are very interesting. Um, that can uh, be leveraged and are currently being explored. And this is one area where CPA is going to be taking a leadership role along with others to um, really think about what are the ways in which we can not just transfer business as usual newsrooms, but, but take a transformative um, approach to saying um, how people can go about um, really um, having a community ownership model that's different than the traditional way that um, entities have been run. And again, you know, I'm just making a thematic case that really leadership and it is going to drive um, the most change because if you don't have modeled what you want to have realized, um, it's very difficult to, um, to, to not have leadership meet a grassroots effort together um, so that you aren't um, you aren't fighting so that you are only working from an area of influence but you're not working from um, from the ability to to be empowered um, and so lastly I just want to say that you know attract develop recognize and retain um, hiring expanded um, from expanded hiring profiles so the more limited the definition the more the more um, struggle we have to make sure that more people um, are um, not just just uh, included, but welcomed and seen as uh, critical to uh, diver diversity and inclusion. Um, equitable compensation plans, you know, I'm sorry, you can fill your room, uh, your newsroom with a ton of diversity, but if you're <laughs> paid in inequitable ways, uh, that's a problem. So that's just one area where the equity has to take place. A couple of other things, um, just um, finding and exploiting innovative, innovative sourcing pools. If you go to the same place, you're going to get the same result. So you need to, to think innovatively about how to reach communities. Um, encourage co-mentoring. I think there's this idea that you know, the, the, it, the publisher's going to take the young whippersnapper under their wing and mentor them. And I would argue that in today's environment, um, people who come into a media operation have just as much likelihood of mentoring the publisher as the other way around. So um, we have the opportunity to also fund high potential candidates and projects um, to create uh, space and opportunity, um, deliver um, substantive performance feedback, 
and provide empowering and interesting opportunities. So this professional development, succession planning, new leaders in this media landscape is, is kind of an, I think a good complement to a lot of the other um, wonderful tools and information that have been shared here today. But I just don't want us to miss the leadership piece because um, I think it's critical to transformative change. So um, they close us out. Yeah, so while this isn't necessarily a quick win, it's more of a long-term um, goal and something that we're working on for, for a long time, um, we do see it as imperative, uh, not optional. Values and cultures are driven from leadership, so we must find ways to diversify ownership while encouraging collaboration. And we hope that we can work with you guys in order to, to reach that goal. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity and for pulling together this forum. No, thank you guys. That was a great presentation and really touches on these core issues of engagement that we're here to talk about. Um, Jordan, you want to take us to what's next? The model that we're following for these working group meetings is, uh, is you know, we share some of these ideas and initiatives that are that are already being undertaken by members of the industry so that people can plug into each other, maybe use some of these resources that Meredith or others introduced that you weren't aware of, maybe spark some ideas. But the, the working group model is always driven towards action and driven towards um, champion driven priorities. So we don't want to spend 30 minutes here talking about what would be great if this happened in our industry or if that happened in our industry, but like, this is what I'm committed to doing. This, these are steps we are committed to taking. These are partnerships we want to form and things we're really wanting to do. So Jordan's going to take us into the next uh, piece of the agenda where we talk about, um, talk about what could be some of these champion driven priorities or any of these initiatives that maybe we missed that, yeah, programs you're already facilitating that that uh, that you'd want to share. So, sorry, Jordan, go ahead and take us away. All right, sure thing. So, touching back to that, we want to not reduplicate the efforts, and we definitely don't want to compete against one another. So, with this, we want to learn like what can we do collaboratively, and how can we support each other to commit to the same mission. So. With this discussion, one of the first questions that we're asking is what opportunities do you see in empowering your audiences to contribute more? Anything that people have heard that they want to get involved with, anything that, that maybe we missed in this, in this working session, we're going to have one every month. So, uh, so plenty of more opportunities to bring you other projects and initiatives happening, but it's kind of an open discussion for anybody who wants to jump in. So um, this is Enrique uh, from RMPM, Kubo, and RMPBS, The Drop. Um, we have a few initiatives that we're doing current outreach for. Um, and I think one of the things that gets missed in um, some of the conversations that we have with the community and the state at large is sometimes we see what Jordan was talking about is duplicating efforts or we're running in parallel to similar projects. Right now we have a project out of the Western um, in Durango, uh, the Four Corners area, where we are starting a um, kind of a storytelling platform for uh, the indigenous community there. Uh, and we're still working on getting the outreach happening but it would be great to be able to amplify that um, through all the great people that are on this call. Um, I think a, a way to facilitate that and have information sharing between these organizations would be, would be terrific. And it'd be, um, it'd be a great way to amplify what everybody's doing and share anything that, that, could be, uh, that we could facilitate or we could uh, include uh, anyone in, anyone on this call in. Um, and that goes for some of the, the radio components that we're doing as well, um, which is not necessarily news, it's, it's, it's music, but there, there are some, uh, there's some opportunities there to, uh, to share this with our audience. Great, thanks Enrique. Uh, I, like, I like Enrique's point about that, and I just wanna offer a suggestion as maybe using SharePoint as a tool, I think a lot of us 
utilize Microsoft Office. Um, but SharePoint may be a good hub for all of us to have access to so that we can all just communicate with each other about our different projects, the steps that we're taking, and you know, different shows, all kinds of things like that, just so that we can coordinate better with each other and have one place where we can find you know, all of our information. Awesome, who is that? I'm sorry, this is Bella Scratch from RMPBS, um, the no drop in KVO. Great, thank you. Uh, Meredith had asked if you can use SharePoint if you don't have Microsoft Office. You know what, I don't think so. I'm not sure that would be something that, that we would need to look into, but even a tool like that you know what i mean where we could all just collaborate in the same place would be so awesome that way our calls monthly would be a lot more impactful because we would be able to share stuff like this in our in our collective space you know so even yeah. if it weren't sharepoint just some sort of tool like that where we could all come together and collaborate would be so cool yeah uh, and Enrique mentioned possibly a Facebook group. I mean, obviously, a lot of us are already working in some ways via Facebook, so that could be um, that could be a good outlet. Uh, and Jordan, if you would just follow up with maybe with Enrique, and you could tag that on to some of the existing uh, Facebook work that you're already doing. Definitely. Great. All right. So our next question is. What challenges do you see in creating a more inclusive media landscape? Power structure. A lot yeah. of it is, is overcoming, I guess the, the, the big obstacle is a little bit of introspection from the people that are in power to give up a little bit of that to be able to give access to the, what, what everybody's talking about here today, which is the next generation of, of, of American media and what that looks like. Um, obviously that's, that's a huge, huge obstacle that uh, I think can be taken in, in, in small pieces. Um, this, is, this, this, this conversation is, is a huge step um, and facilitating the communication that, that we were talking about earlier. Everybody here is doing really great work, but there's also some of the leadership that needs to be um, trained and groomed and, and, and have these, have access. Um, and sometimes that, that just isn't available. I don't, I don't know if that's, that's just something that I see Const, well, over and over and over um, as, as one of the biggest obstacles. I've worked in media for 20 plus years in different capacities, radio, TV, uh, entertainment. And so I run into the same thing in, in various organizations uh, and businesses. So I think that's pretty broad. I don't know that, that I answered any question, anything, but uh, I think that that's, having that conversation with people is, is, uh, is important as, and, and I don't, I guess I don't know the best way to have that conversation with people without being just out direct, as direct as that, you know, um, because it does take a little bit of risk and it, it, it not a little bit, a lot, and it, and it puts people in a situation where they have to give up something. Um, so that's uncomfortable. Thanks, Enrique. I think that also ties into what Jill was saying and noting, noting that like almost half of all uh, members of C Colorado Press Association who run uh, media outlets and, and organizations in the state, nearly half of them are over retirement age. Um, there's an opportunity there for for some of these transitions. And I think some of this engagement where you're shifting the culture is is a baby step in that direction. Philip also sent an email to us a day or two ago just saying like, how do we create newsrooms where 
like a modern Ida B. Wells could could thrive. And I had to do a little bit of research. I'm like, where did Ida B. Wells thrive? You know, like what what were the media outlets that she was publishing about lynching and stuff? And it's not surprising that they, they were black, black owned. Um, and the latter, the majority of her work was done by one that she co-started and, and co-owned. So yeah, it's just, it feels so daunting, but, uh, but yeah. Well, even sure. like independent, uh, you know, giving, even get having, when you have a platform like this, have, giving uh, amplification to some of the other, other uh, people that are doing independent work. Uh, you know, like Brother Jeff is, in Five Points is always doing something. He's interviewing people from the community. He's doing that. And just even sharing that now with, with the reach of social media and digital marketing and all these other things that we have uh, at our disposal for targeting, those things can be super important as tools to be able to reach these folks where they're at. Um, and, and that's right in front of their face and their screen. So there's a whole other tactical way to do this, I think. Um, it's not necessarily what traditional journalism is used to, I guess, but it's more, it starts delving into the line of, of marketing. And I'm always having this discussion with people about what, where's the line and how, and, and, and how do we make sure that the, the amplification piece that's, that's, that's almost advertising doesn't affect the editorial piece. And that's always been a, you know, obviously a, a, a long, you know, a, an ever present uh, uh, fight to, to keep that balance and keep those two things separate. But I think that that's something that we can provide as, as, as larger media organizations. If, if I can jump in, this is Jill, um, and kind of build off of what en Enrique is saying, because it's so important that um, I think we have two things. Uh, they're kind of unrelated, but they're connected. One is just reacting to the fact that we do have, um, you know, media outlet newsroom owners who are, you know, at or approaching or beyond retirement age. Um, that that's an opportunity, and um, and I, I think that people would be surprised about the openness that um, our uh, some of our members have expressed to you know figuring out a path forward um, because they care about their communities and they care about their legacy and they care about journalism and so you know being able to take those three three things and, and put them in the framework of, you know, values and figure out how you might um, bring people along um, in, the, in the community to be able to have some ownership going forward, I think is very exciting. And when it comes to the, um, we really are struggling, you know, what is the differentiation between, you know, journalism and, and others? And I would, I would argue, you know, journalists have, have do a great job of telling other people's stories and not so great at telling their own. And there are differentiations, you know, uh, corrections, retractions, sourcing, verification, um, ethics. Uh, so um, I think there's an opportunity to make sure that however we amplify, we do it within the framework of, of making sure that people um, see this as a, as a trusted source. Absolutely. Uh, keeping the credibility aspect of, of, of the organizations that, that we work with is, is definitely high priority because we don't want to lose that trust that, that's been built up from, from any of these communities, any, any community that, that, that we seek to do outreach with. That, that was much more better put, <laughs> much more concise and, and, and well-worded. Right. So we did have one more question, but I will post it in the Q&A section. So moving ahead, we're starting to look at prioritized areas for shared action. So looking more so to expand upon having these discussions and what should happen what can we start doing as a collaborative to actually deliver more authentic voices in newsrooms 
or train up the next generation of leaders so that will be able to tell their stories. So we're starting to look at the champion driven priorities is one of the biggest things. So whatever you guys are working on, you can share it during after this meeting and in the follow up meeting. So we have more to discuss about and get in a SharePoint tool or something similar to still add to the discussion. So another question we wanted to ask was what are some of the biggest opportunities to expand diversity and engagement of local media? What could drive the next the growth in the next years? I know we touched on like some of the people transitioning out of it and going into retirement. What are some other ways we can do that? Um, this is Meredith from Harkin. Um, I really like the asks and offers approach to breaking down what resources people have and what needs people have. Um, so maybe there's potential to do that around this topic that you mentioned, Jordan, of saying, we're about to hire, I have a need to get this out to more people than we ever have before so that we can get a diverse set of applicants into this hiring process. And then, you know, this community here may have access to that and can provide that outreach. So in my mind, I don't want to get right to the detail, but I'm thinking of like a spreadsheet or something that allows us to keep track of what those asks and offers are so that we can support each other with very specific requests. So that's why I asked you, Enrique, like what, what does it help to amplify? So now I know, okay, I can do that outreach to the communities that I have. Um, and then it gives something tangible that allows us to take action in our own ways. So that's just one idea I had that we could structure um, a little bit and how we participate. So it's not a direct answer to your question, Jordan, but wanted to throw that in there. I think on the back of that, it's it also, it, it's um, sometimes trying to amplify these messages, we don't really think about the back end of, of things and how we, um, how we learn from what our outreach has, has done or hasn't done. Um, so, so for instance, some of the uh, the amplification, I'd like to see a little bit more um, of a follow-up in terms of did this amplification work? If so, to what extent? And do we have any tools that perhaps we can use to track those things? Or even just simple surveys. Um, I used to work in a public health organization and there was always, because they were tied to grants, there were always evaluators of some sort that would go and evaluate the program. Um, and I think that that part uh, in media is sometimes missing, mostly because I think it's so hard to do. Um, and, and if anybody uh, knows of a good way to do this, or perhaps has, has, has experience, I'd be, uh, I'd be uh, definitely interested in, in having a conversation with you. I think that making sure that we're giving our communities um, a voice and empowering them to let them know that um, our organizations are listening and that, you know, we're standing by to support however possible is always um, a great opportunity to facilitate and see changes and growth. Like with the example of the gentleman, I can't remember his name, but they have the radio show or radio station on KGNU that that focuses solely on local music for example when you empower people with a voice it makes them feel included and increases diversity and it makes them uh, want to participate you know everybody just likes to have that voice so I know with the drop one of the things that we'll be working on um, is directing more of our newsletter towards giving you know our constituency and our various communities voices um, so that we can stay tuned into what's going on how people are feeling 
you know, and then be able to figure out and brainstorm where we can support from there and where our deficiencies are, um, just so that we can continue to kind of recycle that, that same spirit of engagement just by uh, lending people a uh, platform. That's great. And as people have those platforms, those openings, or, you know, internship opportunities or volunteer opportunities, keep in mind that we have this growing database of, of job seekers, um, you know, people who didn't, you know, who applied for Philip's job, but didn't get it or applied for, um, you know, we have, I think, three or four people on this call that were hired through this program, but thousands of people that have applied that didn't get hired. And they're still very skilled, qualified, diverse, you know, individuals who are looking for opportunities for work opportunities primarily, but also are really open and hungry for, um, we've offered them to be on the air here at Denver Open Media. We've offered opportunities here, but we don't want to just use that network for our own opportunities. If you guys have opportunities, uh, it's a real gift to them to open up those opportunities. So please let us know and we'll, we'll mobilize this database of skilled job seekers um, to, to help out with whatever opportunities you guys have. Speaking of that, this is Kelly Griffin, Colorado Public Radio. I just posted in the chat. I just learned of this program um, for independence in radio, and it's a great kind of mentorship um, to get new voices, not news voices like the other program, new voices <laughs> in radio. So uh, I've posted it there, and um, I'm not the person leading it. Someone in our newsroom is the captain in this area trying to get people involved. So there's that's a, a great program. I can also speak to that. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hannah and Jordan, please send this out to, to our database. Well, uh, Jordan, I want to respect everyone's time. I want to thank you for keeping us on schedule. It's, it's great. You're getting better every time we do one of these working groups. And I think we've been doing a good job of staying right on schedule. We've got three minutes left. So how do you want to help us wrap up? All right. So say the next thing will be just encouraging everybody to just stay connected and stay involved with this working group. It is one of the most unique things that is being done, especially in media and journalism. So whatever it, uh, communications that is coming out that's going to be out next is going to be our follow-ups and next steps, which will contain those calls for actions and champion-driven priorities. So you'll be receiving that within the next week for me, along with the follow-up and the recap of this meeting. And I know that um, Philip and Melissa are talking about also doing some more engagement works and we're looking forward to partnering with them and getting the word out. So I think, yeah, like Jordan said, keep, uh, keep, keep the lookout because I think we're gonna take these conversations to the next level and hopefully be able to partner with the Colorado Media Project to do that for uh, bringing that up, Tony. And I just, if I could really quickly just let folks know what, what we're talking about. So um, here at Colorado Media Project, we've, um, we've, we have been hearing from a lot of the members of CoLab about how they want to um, uh, really have better engage um, with issues around uh, race with nuance and more historical perspective um, and with respect and empathy. Um, and so we, we're really sort of working on um, trying to put together some journalist to journalist conversations where they where there's a, a space that is safe for um, folks in the newsrooms to really um, examine their own work uh, around these issues as we grapple with what's going on um, currently in our nation and in Colorado specifically. Um, and so it's, it's all very um, in the works right now. There'll be some more information about it coming to you all. Um, but um, it's our, our sort of our first step in addressing um, what needs to change within the culture. Uh, and then hopefully after that, taking that into out to community to really listen to them as well to see how we can be better. So stay tuned. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Um, Jordan, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts, but it's 4.30, we're ending right on time. So uh, I, I was really happy with this. I'm, thank you guys. Obviously these presentations and panels and conversations wouldn't, wouldn't be anything without all the community participation. So thank to everyone who took the time to put together a pr presentation and those who joined into the conversation and, and, and watched. 
uh, we've recorded it and we'll be sending out uh, the recording of the of the Zoom meeting. Uh, and uh, again, shameless plug, one year anniversary of 92.9, 89.3, starting in about 30 minutes, we'll be live streaming some local bands and, uh, and having some more reflection on what's going on in the city and the world today. So thank you everybody for your time. Jordan, any final thoughts? Well, that is all. I summed up everything. Once again, just thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here and attending and just keep up the momentum. Great. We'll follow up. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you.